Hello, everybody. Good morning, and welcome to the Future Now stage. Uh, today, we'll be talking about building a cyber resilient workplace by minimizing human errors. Now, this session um, is brought to you by ICE 71. And um, before we start, I just wanted to go over some housekeeping. So at the end of the session, we'll leave about 10 minutes for questions. So to ask questions, we'll be using Slido. So if you have downloaded the app for NFS, you're already ahead of the game. You can go onto your app and ask your questions directly on Slido within the app itself. If not, you can go onto the website, sli.do, and enter in NFS Unbound, no spaces. And then you'll be able to have access to Slido for this session and be able to ask our panelists questions at the end. So to start, um, hello everybody, thank you for coming. My name is Linda Schindler. I'm the program head of I-71. And to tell you a little bit about I-71, we're the region's first uh, cybersecurity entrepreneur hub. And we're a joint initiative between NUS Enterprise and Singtel Innovate. And we're here to connect the startups, universities, corporates, governments, and the community at large to encourage conversations and collaborations. And so this event and panel discussion is one of those uh, interests that we have that will uh, hope spur on more innovation in the area and more conversations and collaborations. So first, we'll have our panelists introduce themselves, maybe a quick introduction, one minute of who you are. We'll start uh, over there. Sure. Yeah. Hi, I'm Shaylee. I'm a co-founder of a startup called Bluefish. We're a cybersecurity awareness and solutions training company. We essentially, what we do is we help change human behavior through training and reduce uh, cyber, cyber threats as a result of it. Hi, I'm Jamie Lopez. I'm with Booz Allen Hamilton. By trade, I'm an industrial organizational psychologist. I currently lead a team of US-based consultants, and we focus on many general management consulting issues around cybersecurity, data science, and AI. Uh, personally, I, I look at the human element and issues around building a cybersecure workforce. My name is Joshua McLeod. I am the, um, the National Cybersecurity Officer for Cisco Security and Trust Organization. I know that's a, a mouthful. We call our organization STO for short. And our organization is responsible for protecting Cisco, its infrastructure, its products. So we're our internal operations team. But I'm based out here in Singapore because a lot of what we do is uh, trust building with customers, exposing them to how we protect ourselves, how we protect the products, and a lot of the capabilities we engineer into the products that assure that there's integrity there. So that's my focus. Great. So as you can see, we brought together a really broad uh, like panel. Uh, someone from the startup realm who has a non-technical background, um, someone like from Booz Allen who basically invented uh, management consulting. Not you personally, but Booz <laughs> Allen, right? <laughs> and of course, Cisco, who is one of the largest corporations in the US and one of the biggest networking companies in the world. So we should get actually a, a nice um, kind of a view of the landscape in cybersecurity and how we can protect it better. So first, before we start with the panelists, I want to throw out some numbers, right? So let's see how important this issue is. Um, the global cost of cybercrime is expected to exceed $2 trillion in 2019. And this is a fourfold increase from when uh, they last measured it like in 2015. So that's fourfold increase in four years. And the cyber damages are estimated to reach $6 trillion annually. Now, this represents the greatest transfer of economic wealth in history, right? And so it will make it more profitable than the global trade of all major illegal drugs combined. Oh my goodness, right? So these are incredible numbers that we're looking at here. So the, the effects are staggering and so we have to look at how can we prevent these losses and in, in turn then help create and spur innovation. So my first question is then why do you think humans are one of the weakest links in cybersecurity, right? Is, is, it, is it because most people use password one, two, three, four, five, six? Um, so 
just to first start with another number, 95% of these, these cyber attacks that you're talking about start because of a human you know, doing something wrong. And it's not, I, I know most people say you can't fix stupid, but the fact is that most of us are just not aware of what problems we should be looking out for, or what are the, what are the habits that we need to change, or what are the behavioral changes we need in us to reduce the, for the hackers to be able to access our data. Yeah, I, I think the question is also the answer, because you know we are humans, and there's a lot of individual variability in every human. So if you look at one's day, you can be distracted and not pay attention. And you get into the whole currency of individual differences, what your personality is, uh, what your focus level is. Um, do you have something going on in your life where you can't pay attention to a security issue? Or from Shelley's comment, you know, you can't fix stupid in some circumstances. So they may not have the cognitive awareness to really understand and appreciate a security issue. Yeah, I also think humans tend to obviously uh, trust tend to be gullible, want to see the best in people. And so, you know, it's part of our better nature that in many ways we are susceptible to these things. But I would say another aspect is the sheer complexity of the environment. Given the number of cloud services that people uh, use, the number of software applications, the emails they get in a day, there's just not simply enough time to analyze everything and to put that skeptic's hat on and, and truly appreciate the, the consequences of clicking on a link or an attachment or visiting a particular website. So I, I face it as well. So, you know, uh, through my inbox, I have, like, if it's an email just sent to me from, uh, you know, not a source that I know, I probably look at it for about two seconds because I've got to get on to the next thing. And in that two seconds, do I have enough time to really decide if this is something I'm going to follow up later, I'm going to delete or consider spam or something else like that? It's just an onslaught and there's just a fatigue that I think makes it difficult to stay on top of these threats. Right. And I mean, I think, you know, with the, the email, with the internet, the increased use of the cloud, it's just more susceptibility and more cyber attacks at scale that we have to worry about. So, I mean, I want to focus in on Cisco. Uh, the numbers that I've seen are 85% of the internet traffic travels across Cisco systems. And it's the, and the fastest growing business is, cyber, is the cybersecurity unit in Cisco. So, you know, having those staggering numbers, I, I think we all want to know what are some of the unique cybersecurity challenges that Cisco faces and how do you address them? Yeah, coming from an internal perspective, so we are focused on three key things in the security and trust organization. Protecting Cisco, which is our day-to-day -day defense of our enterprise business operations, our intellectual a assets. Protecting our products, because we actually run our secure development lifecycle program within Cisco. Let the engineers be innovative, but we run the program that tries to ensure that they build things secure by design. And then ultimately, um, you know, share that information with customers and earn their trust. So uh, one of the things that we focus on internally in Cisco is, sorry, just on the question again, what was it? The uh, approaches to protecting our infrastructure. So uh, Actually, the, cult... the unique, the unique cyber yeah, yeah, yeah. challenges. Yeah, so Cisco, interestingly, is an open environment in many respects. We've always had kind of a trust but verify culture. If you consider a banking organization, which tends to lock things down, everybody's issued a standard PC with standard software, and there are very rigid controls around what you can do. I'm not saying that's every environment, but that's one type of environment. Cisco is really not that way. From the beginning, we have invited people, our employees, our guests, our customers, to connect to our network infrastructure to collaborate, to innovate, to really take advantage of all that uh, the technology offers. So given that environment that we don't want to constrain our users too much, and we obviously have to protect ourselves, we take kind of an aggressive monitoring and response approach. We have complete visibility across our infrastructure. So one of the things that we focus on is using network traffic metadata. Uh, commonly known as NetFlow. We look at everything going on across the network. There's roughly about 47 terabytes worth of data going through our infrastructure that we're monitoring constantly at the DNS layer, at the email layer, at the actual pocket, packet layer between one access point and another access point. And so we're constantly monitoring that data and applying analytics to understand deviations of behavior and what might be considered suspicious and automation in terms of playbooks that are designed to spot 
incidences or things that may be of concern and then kick off a complete automation process around notifying an incident responder, giving them sufficient context to make a decision around a particular threat, and then the tools to quickly contain that threat. So the very focus of our security environment, rather than locking things down, you know, to sum this up, is about being very agile in how we monitor and respond to threats. Okay. So it looks like, you know, you're talking, when you're talking about those kind of threats, you're talking about kind of threats from the outside. So Jamie, I, I wanted to ask you, how would an organization manage an insider threat versus a more innocuous, like, human error? Sure, I, I think that starts with understanding your employees. So we know many companies now are having very rigorous selection and assessment programs. So you can understand their personality. So, and, and if you look at that, there's different tiers of personality. And as we're, Josh was saying, there's different indicators of compromises that uh, would indicate some insider threat. So if you pair those two things together, you start understanding that we could have a uh, kind of an insider threat issue. So if you look at, you know, there's two types of kind of threats in an organization from a security perspective, you have witting and unwitting. Within the unwitting group are people that just don't know they're doing something wrong, but you can teach them and train them to do better. Uh, you also have people that just may not have the personality to really be conscientious. Uh, they're not skeptical, they don't question, they just do things, and they, they, they can be mischievous and take risks. Above that, you have folks that uh, maybe have uh, some anger issues or you know affective personality disorders. And if you look at that, you know, they get into counter workplace behavior. So you have the active sabotage. Those are, that's kind of state dependent though. So if you, know, you have an active manager, you can kind of see that this person's going through some trouble and maybe we can intervene there. The worst category as you start looking at are this dark triad of personality factors where you have narcissism, psychopathy, and, and Machiavellianism. And those are kind of your human advanced persistent threats. They go under the radar and uh, they can do really bad stuff. You know, either a state actor or a criminal group can get into your system and really compromise it. So you need the technology to look for those IOCs, but you need an understanding of your people as well and, and awareness from the managerial perspective. So when one of your clients comes to you and says, you know, like, what do I need to do? I mean, it sounds like there are a million things that you need to do. So what would be the top three things that you would r recommend? Sure, for critical you know, infrastructure positions and people with access to a lot of PII or other sensitive trade secrets or confidential information in the government, uh, you'd want to put them through some kind of psychological screening. That's part one. Two is having an automated solution that Joshua's talked about that look for those IOCs in the system and you can have those correlates that say, why are they in here at night printing out information when nobody's here? Uh, you know, these weird indicators that you need to probe into, and uh, that, that's how I would do it. But, you know, it's a risk management approach, just like all cybersecurity. You can't do this with everybody, so you tier it at your most uh, sensitive and vulnerable positions with the access and placement access to the data. In fact, if I could just piggyback on that to give a very practical example of what Cisco does. In certain countries that we consider high risk, where if an employee leaves, they may take some intellectual property over to a competitor, we effectively put a tap on that employee where we're monitoring all of their communications, their net flow, everything. And because a lot of this is encrypted, you know, you can't necessarily get at the content. So we have to understand what are the patterns that are unique, that are deviating from what we've seen them uh, doing over time. And then looking at those suspicious patterns, we dig a little bit deeper, find out what did they access? What was the file, the server, and what did they do with that? And ultimately have a conversation with their manager. It's not something that can scale to every employee. So I agree with your point around this has to be risk centric, but then there's a lot of insight you can gain just by monitoring the user's activity in the network infrastructure. Right, and, and I agree with that. Uh, you know, especially when you have an event where a person's leaving the firm, they yeah. become almost a high risk at that point, exactly. and you don't want them to walk out the door. I, yeah. I completely agree. Yeah. So, in fact, uh, a very, very relevant point that, you know, everybody's different. We're all different personalities, and so training cannot be the same for you and for me. And so making relatable and contextualizing the content is something that's really, really important. So how do you so, do that? So for example, if you're gonna talk about, if in Singapore's context, choping, you know, we leave our business cards to block a spot at a food court. And that's not something that would happen in the US. But, you know, someone could take that business card, use those credentials and information, and uh, create a fake account, you know, in your name. And that could lead to cyber threat. But 
this is a common practice here and talking about that is relatable to people here and so then they can engage with the content and understand, okay, this is how I can be more careful about my information. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, what's interesting is we're talking about these technical solutions, right, in the human element. So I know, Shaylee, you ha your startup, you know, you're talking about building human firewalls. Now, what does that mean? So essentially what we do is we're empowering uh, employees to become part of the defense because at the end of the day, no matter how much technology you put in place, if, uh, if your employees are not aware and if they're going to click on the wrong phishing email, then it is still going to get, you know, lead to a cyber attack. So uh, empowering them through knowledge, through awareness, through relatable content, through which is customized for them, which is, you know, you can go to YouTube, for example, and get any amount of information, but you can go to Netflix, and Netflix curates the content for you. So we, we essentially do that. Our training and solutions and training uh, content is customized and with relatable content for the individuals. That's how we create human firewalls. And just adding on to that again, bringing it from uh, inside a, a company that's dealing with these things and trying to uh, manage them, we have an internal phishing program uh, that of course is there to try to induce employees to click on the link and, when, and if they do click on the link, it takes them to a website that offers some education. One of the things that I think has been interesting out of this is kind of a, a culture of gamification has developed around this in a sense that we have discussion groups within Cisco around the latest phishing email. Did you catch it? What could have been better with this? Oh, I didn't get caught by it. It's just a cultural phenomena that, okay, so you guys are talking about it and everybody now knows that this was a phishing email that's out there. But the great thing is you're having the conversation and the user awareness is spontaneously evolving from that. Yeah, exactly. Our platform actually does that. And then instead of, and it does positive enforcement as well. So there's a leaderboard. So you see that, oh, my colleague there has helped his department get so many points. Uh, I better back up, <laughs> like start doing more training so I can get my department some more points. So there are different ways of really encouraging and creating a culture of awareness that leads to better behavioral patterns. Just one point, the difference between great training and good training is, the, and Shelly hit on this point, is how you contextualize it to the organizational culture. So what we would do within a defense type client is very different than what we would do in a startup or an IT client. Just because the, the individual motivators and risk tolerance and profile are just very different. You know, in defense, they, they gravitate to you know, big, dark, scary threats where you come with a big, dark, scary cyber threat in more of a startup, you get pushback. So, uh, but the core skills are the same from the cybersecurity perspective. Okay. So, I mean, we're discussing about how humans are the weakest link in cybersecurity. So, if we moved everything onto AI, would that solve the cybersecurity problem? So, the trend is that Clearly, AI is taking over a lot of the uh, you know, jobs which are being done by humans. And uh, it's an interesting way to, uh, it's an interesting thought. Like, is that gonna reduce the you know, risk or is it gonna increase? Because at the end of the day, AI is also still code. It's still, you know, there can be uh, vulnerabilities in AI and uh, that could also lead to cyber attacks. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, with AI and, and any kind of encrypted technology, you know, if it's built by a human and a human has access to it, you can penetrate it. And just despite best efforts around technology and mathematics, a, a human can still mess it up. And I think AI will help with the challenge of managing complexity and information at scale, helping to surface the things that are most important that we should be focusing on. But ultimately, it's going to come down to a human to not only uh, you know, take a look at that and research, was this benign or was this really an incident, and then take a decision to do something about it. So I see AI really as an enabler to help us manage this environment, not a solution to the problem, though. Okay, so as we're looking for solutions to the problem, we have to go to the key stakeholders, right, the decision makers. So how do you think we can talk to the C-suite, the decision makers, about cybersecurity and humans and, and how to make their companies more cyber resilient? Uh, one of the ways we do it and we, is through tabletop exercises. We actually take a room of, uh, we go to a room of 
um, you know, senior leaders within an organization, and we'll literally take them through an exercise where um, this is what is your, so we did it with a school actually here in Singapore with their senior, le senior leadership, and we said, okay, the school has been attacked. Your, you don't have access to your data, and what will you do? Take your crisis management plan, take your policies, take your process, and, and figure out what your next steps are gonna be, and they, we literally make them go through every step. And the other thing is that, uh, besides just the tabletop exercise, they also have to realize that, um, what it, how are you gonna communicate? What are you gonna tell the parents? What are you gonna tell the, you know, you have to maintain the reputation of your school as well. So that's just an example. That's one of the ways that we. I see this uh, reflected exactly in the enterprise world as well, where um, you have to establish that mind share with leadership that sets the tone from the top. Because if they don't take care about cybersecurity, the technologies, the expertise in the organization is really all going to be for naught. You need to have it start from the top. And I think there, I agree with you, there is no better way than people putting, putting people in a situation where they have to experience the potential outcomes. Um, so not only do you want to do that at a leadership level, but I think you want to do it cross-functionally so that you know you, you gin up cybersecurity incidents as you do a tabletop exercise, but you include people from the lines of business, from the risk management groups. It's not an IT-centric thing, and you, you really have to help them appreciate the importance of cross-functional communication and the, the issues that arrive if they don't communicate and they don't recognize that this is a shared responsibility. Well, I agree with both my colleagues on stage here. A uh, couple other points I, I would think about is one, coming with a maturity assessment to see the level of sophistication of the board themselves and also the, the executive suite. You may have you may only be moving them to a degree of cyber fluency at this point, not actual uh, exercise development, war gaming and, and simulations. But uh, you know, one other thing around the simulations, exercises of war gaming is you actually get a, a chance to really test your incident response when you go through that and improve upon it, and that resonates. And every organization that is part of an ISAC or uh, has been compromised themselves, that's when you know an IT problem, security problem becomes a business problem, and that's really the proof point. So that, they learn quickly, and then you'll have a new organizational design. Yeah, in fact, that. I want to piggyback on what you said. I'm sorry, I just keep piggybacking. I don't mean to be, be, be you know, the piggy on everybody's back. But I, what you just said actually, um, you know, brought to, to, to mind a particular point that I think is important too, which is that the conversation has to change. One from you know, threats and all of the things that can go wrong to what, are the, what is the impact on the business in terms of innovation and growth opportunities. It's not just that you'll lose money because you'll have to pay out ransom demands or you'll have to spend this amount on a breach, but think about the restraining costs that having inefficient systems for managing security poses on the business, which is either they're reluctant to take the risk to enter a certain market because they don't have the confidence that the business can manage the risk, or things are so strict, the policies are so strict that the organization simply can't do things that would push the boundaries. And so I think when you change the context around the impact of cybersecurity as an enabler of digital transformation and digital capabilities, then senior leaders start to cotton on to the importance of it. Right, so I think we're talking about, you know, cybersecurity as becoming a value center as opposed to a cost center. But when we look at it realistically and we're posing these questions, I mean, what is a greater motivator? Fear or? or <laughs> uh, it just depends on the personality of the person, right? If, if, the, if, if you identify that, you know, uh, so one of the things we do when we talk about IoT devices uh, in our modules is uh, most people think of, you know, be like, okay, well, boring. But if you tell someone that uh, someone can hack into your baby monitor and could scare your kid in the night, that's gonna, you know, wake them up and be like, oh, wait, let me update the software. <laughs> let me change the password of my home Wi Fi. And, uh, you know, just it leads to automatic change of behavior. So fear is one of them. No, I agree. It's about uh, contextualizing to a personal motivator, whether that's uh, you know risk aversion or some kind of enabling function. Something good could happen or something bad could happen. And optimally, the best reinforcement schedules would look at both. 
I mean, and so as we're, as we're looking at all, all of these potential um, solutions, so, you know, I want to know then what, what, like, for example, your organization, you work, what role does your particular organization play in protecting Cisco? Um, and how does that, and how much of it is internal versus external? You know, um, we predominantly protect Cisco from an internal perspective, but that, you know, you have to view that as a threat landscape that we view as a shared threat landscape. So a vulnerability to Cisco in many ways is a vulnerability to our customers. If somebody is able to breach our organization in a way that they can access intellectual property, modify it, and that some way, somehow makes its way into our code base and ultimately into a product, then that's an issue. That's why our organization is more than just defend Cisco's network. It's defend Cisco's network and the services we deliver to customers and the business ecosystem that we maintain. So Cisco obviously, uh, like a lot of companies out there, uses offshore development centers uh, in India, for example, who develop a lot of our code. Um, even though they have a responsibility to protect our intellectual property in their infrastructure, we don't completely outsource that responsibility. So we monitor their environment, particularly on sensitive projects. We also focus on engineering security into our products. So one of the biggest concerns that you know, we have is what if somebody could modify the software on our network devices, either at the firmware or the operating system level? Unfortunately, we've seen it happen, and in some cases it's been done by very advanced nation state actors. So some technologies that our team has developed, you know, this is not the engineering teams that develop the routers and the switches, but our own organization have been a set of secure boot technologies. So we engineer the chip, we engineer the process that ultimately ensures that when a product arrives on site and boots up, it's running legitimate Cisco uh, hardware and software. So these are just some of the activities. As I say, it's predominantly protect Cisco, but we recognize that our attack surface is ultimately all of our customers and everyone else out there, their attack surface, as you mentioned, a very large percent of the internet runs on our infrastructure. Yeah. And, yeah. and how about you, Jamie? Well, yeah, I, you know, personally, I've been playing a little bit more in the threat intelligence space. So, you know, there you need to upgrade the skills a bit of your usual, I would call it a threat intelligence analyst 1.0. We're trying to migrate to a 2.0 modality where you have higher levels of critical thinking, uh, where you're embedded in a fusion center as a threat intelligence analyst, so you understand the other disciplines. So as you put forward either a mission-centric or a strategic intel product, uh, you understand the limitations of the technologies and also the tradecraft and TTPs of your adversary or you know if there's APT10 or 25 out there. So those are the kind of things that we're trying to do from uh, the human capital perspective. And are you looking at, like, how, do you actually help protect the internal functions as well? No, we, it... I, I'm client facing, so I'm not on the inside part. But uh, some of the work that we do for clients, we do import back into the firm. Right. Okay. okay. Um, in order to take uh, this moment to remind you that if you guys have any questions for our panelists, remember to go onto your Innofest Unbound app and for the Slido function to ask, or go onto the website at sli.d. Uh, do and um, ask your questions there. So you know we've talked a bit about kind of like the, the technical parts um, that are essential to protecting uh, the company in a cyber crisis. Maybe now we can talk a little bit about what are some of the non-technical skills that you think are essential during a cyber hack and during a cyber crisis. Um, yeah. So non-technical skills. Well. Um, if you actually have experience, like if you find yourself in a situation where you've clicked on a phishing email, then it's, you re it's really about like knowing what to do next. So if you're in an organization and you clicked on it, then you would you know, follow the policy and contact the person and actually inform uh, the IT team. But if it's in your, for yourself, like if you happen to, then it's just really about you know, back up your data, uh, you know, keep it in a different location and things like that. But that, I mean, you still have to have some technical skills to be able to protect your own uh, data. I mean, I, I think from the individual level, uh, you, you need a culture that is non-attributional. It's more educational. So I make a mistake. I'm not in big trouble. We discuss why this is a mistake. And that, that's a managerial function, the culture function. But during an actual incident from an IR perspective, you really need to lock down that chain of command quickly. 
let the engineers and the technical people solve the problems. You have information flow to the executive board and your crisis communications officer. That has to all be tested and, and defined a priori. And to the point where if you have contractors in there, you need to empower them to actually do their job and not have somebody come in and, and disrupt the remediation plan. So, uh, you know, it's, it's nice on one side by we're not attributional, but when you're in an incident, you really have to lock it down. Yeah, from an internal uh, incident response perspective, our uh, security operations teams look for individuals who are good communicators and good collaborators. Because in a crisis situation, you need to obviously be able to digest some very complex uh, concepts, some, some challenging ideas, and drive that information out to a responsible team. And when it comes to collaboration, it's a person who is predisposed to work with other people and to recognize that they don't have all the answers and they depend on other people with other expertise. And we see those people who are good at collaboration are also good at building networks personal networks because when the balloon goes up and an incident occurs oftentimes it depends on knowing a particular person who has that piece of the puzzle that's going to help you out and taking the time to invest in that personal network and establish that rapport with that person so when things go wrong you can come together in a very trusted way and so these are personality types that our uh, operations teams look for when we hire people and Joshua to, to underscore your point that that becomes even more important you're dealing at like a critical infrastructure uh, sector level because you're reaching across enterprises, not just within your own. So yeah, your, your point's well taken. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, we've talked about the technical solutions, we talked about the non-technical solutions. Now, what do you see are the trends in cybersecurity right now? Sure, I mean, from a hygiene perspective, you know, CDM is very important, systems that uh, where you a priori upload uh, IOCs before your system even gets hit. These are you know, key things, uh, response frameworks that are automated, the, the key things coming online. More assessment around personality types on the front end and very well designed insider threat programs. I, I see that coming to bear. There, uh, there are two things I'll mention here. Um, we, uh, from a Cisco perspective, are increasingly worried about attacks against network infrastructure itself. So one of the trends that we've seen growing is that attackers have recognized that compromising an endpoint is one way into an infrastructure and to com uh, conduct a breach, but it also requires you to you know, kind of move laterally in the infrastructure, and it can take a lot of time to understand the infrastructure and compromise different systems. So why go after the endpoint when if you go after network infrastructure itself, routers, switches, these devices which are running all the time often, people don't apply patches to them as frequently as they do to endpoint, and are considered very critical, and so you don't necessarily take them offline, and people don't think about protecting these as endpoints themselves. They have some vulnerabilities associated with them, and if somebody does manage to compromise that, they're in a very powerful position. They can essentially pivot across many of your segmented environments, monitor traffic that's going through and understand what's going on in your environment much more powerfully than they could elsewhere. So that's one side. That's a threat trend that we're seeing and we're, we're monitoring closely. On the other side, one of the things that we're seeing is the challenge that you referred to earlier is hygiene. We're still terrible at it. Uh, the DHS in the U.S. released a report, you know, a scorecard for U.S. government agencies around how they have just not been doing a lot of the things they said they should be doing over time and they're not keeping systems up to date, inventorying systems, and all of these things. And one of the things that I think will begin to help us with this, because again, it comes down to a bit of a human problem here, is the, implicate, the implementation of blockchain for continuous auditing and compliance. The idea that everything we do, whether it's a change we write to software, a configuration, a change in hardware, will be continuously put onto the blockchain so that we can understand at a moment's glance what is the posture of everything in our infrastructure and then apply rule sets that look for whether or not this is in compliance and out of compliance because it's difficult right now to stay up to speed with all of the changes in infrastructure. We do auditing maybe once a year if we're lucky. So instead, let technology handle some of this for us. And I think that that is one trend where, you know, blockchain obviously is oftentimes a buzzword. Whatever your problem is, it doesn't matter, just use blockchain. This is an application where I see it could actually make a difference. 
I mean, we're talking about these buzzwords now, right? right. AI, blockchain, uh, I don't know if someone's gonna talk about ICO next or something like that, but as we're talking about all of this, you know, what comes to mind is startups, right? Innovation, how do we get there with these older MNCs, they are really resistant to change. So how can we find a way, right, to get that innovation that we need, that kind of, that spark that fire that, that can help the MNCs really you know, understand the problem and start to resolve this. So what have you seen in terms of working with startups? I mean, I guess I'll, talk, I'll start with you, Shaylee. You, you actually have a, a cybersecurity startup yes. and with a non-technical background, you came up with this yeah, idea. So actually, uh, you know, it is really being not a non-technical, or rather not being a cybersecurity expert has been a big advantage because uh, to be able to make people aware of the issues you need to be able to communicate to them in their language and not use technical terms. And so we've really used that to create a content and training material uh, to be able to really deliver the message to every end user. Uh, in terms of uh, how do startups really be able to engage, uh, we've, we've actually, at least in Singapore, we've seen a lot of support from I-71, who's really helped us to connect with the uh, with the large the big boys, you know, uh, the accelerate program, the mentors that came in, and uh, that's really helped us in uh, connecting and really being able to see what are the problems that that enterprises are facing and how can startups help in solving those smaller problems that they don't have the bandwidth to solve or they don't have the ability or the time to solve those uh, pain points. Um, one thing that we're doing at Booz Allen is, uh, you know, our solutions are generally platform agnostic. So we can do business with uh, a variety of startups. We can work with big companies like Cisco, Amazon, Dell, and we're building solutions with them to bring to our clients to fit into their infrastructure. Uh, but we're always a buyer for, like, you know, good startup talent or good startup technology. And we've even sunsetted one of our own threat intelligence programs to buy somebody else's that we thought was more sophisticated. So uh, it's about having sensors in the marketplace, being willing to pull the trigger and bring the technology into a more established company so you can scale it. Yeah, I agree. It's, a, it's, it's fundamentally about being engaged across the ecosystem. So working with startup organizations to see about promising new capabilities and whether that's something that could be uh, additive to Cisco's offering, something in the future we might acquire. Obviously, we acquire a lot of companies over time. Uh, then we also anchor a lot of these engagements in our global network of innovation centers. So we've got four innovation centers here in APJC. We've got more in Europe. And the idea is that we take a focus that's specific to the country. So you can imagine manufacturing is not the focus of the Singapore Innovation Center. It's the focus of the Japan Innovation Center. Singapore is more around cybersecurity blockchain. In Australia, we've got a focus around mining. So having these innovation centers allow us to work with the ecosystem in the local environment to solve the local problems and ultimately bring together the right partners in that market so that you know we find is this a build, co-develop, or buy type of opportunity. And, and as, I mean, I have to say, yeah, thank you, Cisco. They are a corporate partner of I-71, and they have helped us a lot in um, mentoring our startups. And so, I mean, in that sense, you know, we're talking about communication and, and trying to get the, the most maybe uh, current uh, solutions that are out there. Now, how, how important then is that communication within the system if you're in the ecosystem, if you're trying to find these solutions, you're trying to... Uh, analyze the threats, identify the threats. Do you talk to a lot of the partners in the ecosystem? Or is this something that the machine just spits out information at you and you don't need to actually talk to any of your other counterparts? Well, just uh, one of the thoughts I, I wanted to share was, so uh, some of the l uh, larger companies that we've spoken to and worked with, we find that they might do everything uh, to you know, build their cybersecurity maturity. Uh, but they work with vendors, and then they work with partners who don't necessarily have the same level of cyber maturity. And that can lead to, you know, issues. So a lot of larger organizations have to then uh, bring the, the vendors into their fold and say, okay, yeah, these are the steps we're taking 
to increase our cyber maturity, and this is how we can help you, and these are the steps you should take, or collaborate and do, you know, awareness training, so it's not just for your organization, but if you make your vendors and partners also, employees also aware, it can help your company as well. Yeah, and, and I think from the information sharing standpoint, when you're at an industry or sector level, it's vital. And uh, the good thing is when people are working who are in the security business, they're not necessarily motivated by the P&L of the organization. They want to solve the problem. They want to share information and tend to be more collaborative. So it's, it's a good system to have, and, and, and it's fairly accurate. But uh, you know, from another standpoint, if you're a larger organization, I would just caution to be aware Caution of institutional arrogance. You don't have all the solutions. You need to listen to smalls in the ecosystem so you can then develop a solution or scale a smalls business. So it's, you gotta be careful. Yeah, there's very much a human dimension that's important for us as well. Uh, one of the programs we run in Cisco is a residency program where we bring in interns as well as professionals in the field to spend time in our security operations center working side by side on a day to day basis with our teams. So that helps us because, you know, obviously they get exposure to some of our products. And we don't exclusively use our products. We use whatever works to protect Cisco. Sometimes it's our product. But it helps to train them in a way that when they go back to their organization, they're transferring those skills and expertise and thus strengthening the cybersecurity posture of the overall ecosystem in which we all have to operate. But there is a unique thing that comes out of that, which is the relationship with that individual in that company. And a, and a quick anecdote, um, the WannaCry attack uh, that, that happened some years ago. Um, our analysts inside of our security operations team got a 24-hour heads up about it because somebody who had once been a resident in our program and they maintained that relationship said, hey, we're seeing this on our infrastructure. Our threat intelligence is, is uh, recording this. we just like to let you know. And you know, that's a huge difference that couldn't have occurred you know, without having that kind of personal collaboration and ongoing investment in people that has to happen. Right, so it's funny, right? We're talking about how humans are the weak link in solving the problem, and here we actually have an instance of where it's important to be part of the ecosystem and have, talk to each other uh, to get this kind of intelligence. So, I mean, I guess before we get into the questions, I, maybe if you could end with, where, where do you see the, the cybersecurity like, headed for companies? Because it is a, a horizontal that's now cutting across all verticals, right? It, there's nobody that's, all, almost nobody that's gonna be untouched by cybersecurity. So what do you see happening in five years, maybe even 10 years, if you can see that far ahead? Well, I, I, I can tell you something that we're seeing right now, and one of the, um, one of the things we're coming across is that there's so much sophisticated technology which is being um, innovated every day, new startups, even within large organizations like Cisco. But, this, but, the, but there's no mechanism for, for clients to find out about the technology or to be able to really understand how to use it or even figure out what is it that they need to use. Yes, there's management consulting firms that advise, but not every SME has access to management consulting firms. And so one of the things we're working on, it's our next phase, is to create training uh, around understanding uh, these new technologies in cybersecurity. Why do you need them? Uh, how can you use them? And so we work with uh, companies like Custodio, um, Harangi, a lot of the cybersecurity companies that come out with products and we create modules that'll help them to sell but also to train their clients on how to use it. So this is one of the most recent trends that I'm seeing. Like, I think technology is gonna provide lift to the overall workforce in cybersecurity and you're gonna see some jobs that become out of fashion or outdated and we're gonna have to redeploy and reskill those people into new areas. And uh, But that's actually a good thing because we have you know, lift, which uh, remediates some of the labor shortfalls right now. I see that there's going to be an increasing demand for explicit trust around the technologies that we rely on. I think gone are the days that I use this because it comes from Cisco and they're a big company, they've been around for a while, I should trust them, or Microsoft or any others. I mean, not that we're not trustworthy, but how do we explicitly expose that trust to you, create a level of transparency where you can validate for yourself that we've done the things correctly. 
And I heard somebody else use this analogy, which I like a lot, that it's comparable to the ingredients label on a product. When you go into a supermarket and you buy whatever it is, your can of beans, it tells you the nutrition facts on there, it tells you what you're getting inside of there, and increasingly where it comes from, where it's sourced. Uh, is it organic or not? Does it use GMOs? You know, I'm not gonna make a call on whether those are good or bad, but people want to be informed. And I think that's a similar thing we're going to want to see in what we consume from a technology perspective. This code here that was developed, what's inside of it? Are there any open source libraries? Is it the most current version that you know, deals with these bugs? Where was this product manufactured and how was it transited to me when I consumed it? Or where am I consuming the service from? What network infrastructure is it transiting? I think there are technical capabilities that will enable us to expose that, again, to bring back blockchain technologies, but I think people are going to want to see greater demonstration of explicit trust in what they consume. Thank you. Okay, so now let's take a look to see uh, what questions our audience has. Okay. Okay, so we'll um, start with how can the cost of cybersecurity protection be brought to a level that is acceptable to the masses? So is that for Booz Allen? <laughs> can I have a lifeline for that question? <laughs> but uh, look, I, I think w when we're uh, working at a, a national level, there's opportunities for governments to build better perimeter security and, and work at a national ecosystem level to upgrade the educational system and upgrade awareness around cyber hygiene issues. And if you have people who are more cyber fluent, uh, less errors are committed, less uh, security mistakes, uh, which will ultimately drive down the cost of remediation efforts and other technologies. So that's how I would answer that. I think there's kind of a duty at the national level to think of protecting the nation from a cyber perspective as equal to defending the nation against a kinetic attack. So what are the defenses that the nation is involving? And obviously, as citizens of that nation, contributing you know, our resources to support that. So I think, uh, you know, not to big up Singapore, but I think Singapore gets it right in many respects. I think they're, the way they protect critical national infrastructure, they've consolidated to one agency that is ensuring that guidelines and strategy are being implemented across all of the sectors. Um, I think that you know citizens have to recognize that their tax investments have to go towards this. And I think when they start to realize that there's not only a safer environment, but um, the reputation of the country of a safe place to do business, you know, where you're free from types of scams or cyber attacks, things like that, people will start to recognize over time that this, this is worth the investment that they and the government are paying to protect the environment. It's not just the, you know, the, the being secure against attacks, it's safeguarding the economy and the innovation capacity of the nation as a whole. So with that mindset, I think people will start to recognize that this is a level of investment that appeals to the masses. Okay, so we can go to the next question. So with solutions and companies like Bluefish to minimize human errors, why are human errors still the biggest issue and how can we bridge this gap? I'll take that. Um, so, uh, so, it, so there are a lot of uh, companies out there that do cybersecurity awareness training and a lot of actually companies uh, do the training internally as well, so without you know, necessarily outsourcing it to companies like Bluefish. But yet the, the statistics show that it's only 10%. It's only 10% of the companies that are actually doing awareness training within the organization. And so there's still large lack of awareness amongst uh, people about cybersecurity. Um, this one's for Jamie. There are many internal protections like firewall, packet monitoring, et cetera. Are external threat actors in the deep dark web a growing issue? Short answer, yes. I mean, if we look at the news right now, uh, you know, state actor level is at a level we've never seen before. Uh, we have major nation states engaging in pretty close to cyber warfare right now. Every battlefield commander's playbooks is start with a cyber attack before a kinetic attack. So yes, you know, it's a big issue. 
Um, in the context and perspective of the 1.5 million Sing Health data breach in 2018, where do you see leadership and culture in relation to minimizing human errors? You know, um, I think the COI, the Committee of Inquiry, did a really good job of capturing a lot of the deficiencies and the opportunities for improvement with regard to this. So one and a half million uh, health records were absconded with. And what the report shows us is that there was inadequate training uh, for individuals in critical roles. There was a culture of perhaps maybe not Maybe retribution is too strong a word, but don't bother me with this, you know, or if you raise something and it turns out to be nothing, then you're going to get in trouble for waking me up on the weekend. And then ultimately, the oversight to ensure that, um, you know, the, the standard processes around how we report information, who gets informed, and the diligence and responsibility of that person to oversee and carry it forward, that was lacking. And so what, you know, what I see there is that all of those things came down to leadership and culture, frankly. That was at the root cause, the lack of training. Best effort by individuals, but that doesn't matter if they don't have the organization and the support structure around them to make a difference. Um, so, you know, the technology was there to detect and protect against the threat, but I think things started to fall down when it came to people. So hugely important. Uh, let's see. For Joshua, what do you do with employees who repeatedly fail the phishing exercise? Uh, it's, it's a question of whether we fire them or execute them. We're still not uh, sure. No. Uh, no. There, there are, um, there, you know, we take the approach of this is an educational opportunity. And so I know there are companies out there that I have heard go to the extremes of considering termination for an employee. That's not a direction we're ever going to go in. At least I can say that now. So what we do is obviously people who repeatedly fail, um, their managers are notified and they have a discussion with them and we engage them with some of our teams for extra training. But that's about the level, you know, we, we never go beyond using this as an opportunity to manage the employee better. Okay. Um, let's see, how do we balance the needs of cybersecurity versus the needs for privacy? Uh, so, to me, cybersecurity and uh, productivity are like two. So, the more you increase cybersecurity, the lower the productivity is. So, you really have to find the right balance between how, to what level do you want to maintain your privacy, but not reduce your personal productivity. So, I was actually just talking to somebody yesterday. I said, uh, if you're not using your application on your phone at all times, you have to log out. And they were like, oh my god. So then I have to like type in that password again. And then if you have two level of verification, then you have to do that all over again every time I want to access my emails on my phone. And I was like, yeah, it will reduce your productivity, but it is a more secure way of maintaining privacy. So yeah. I see that they go hand in hand. I don't. I would take out the verse there. Cybersecurity, uh, privacy, data protection, identity protection, all of those are aspects of, of cybersecurity. As defenders, the need to protect privacy does make our jobs harder. And over time, we've found some very innovative ways to get around that, to do traffic analytics at the network level, uh, to use behavioral analytics. Um, I think it's important that you, you protect data pr protection, you, you protect privacy and identity, and you manage that, and it's just part of the overall cybersecurity strategy that you have to manage. Okay, for Jamie, what innovative solutions do you see organizations doing to protect themselves and their customers from spoofing and phishing, besides fish training? <laughs> I think we'll have smarter firewalls and diagnostic monitoring. We're already seeing that right now. And uh, so you, if you can reduce the number of, of attacks and, and have a system understand and recognize that, we, the person has less of a cognitive load, they don't have information overload, and uh, they can focus on other threats and, and uh, don't get tricked as much. So let the machine, basically, let the machines catch 80% of this stuff and the person will have more cognitive bandwidth to look at the other 20%. Okay. Um, how do we prevent employees from the misuse of corporate email services or using corporate time to conduct malicious actions? Um, 
I'd say, uh, I mean, most companies have policies in place around things like this in terms of uh, where, what it, are you allowed to use your corporate email on your personal phone? Uh, there are a lot of policies, but actually what's missing is communication of these policies. And that's actually something else that we do is we customize our content to include these policies as well. So that, you know, you are making your employees aware that, you know, while you may have signed off on the code of conduct, but you've never read it, here, this is what you should know that you, you know. Um, from, from technological perspective, uh, I'm sure you guys have something in place that prevents it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think most uh, workplaces should be a nice place to work and, and we shouldn't have a police state, but there are, we should have parameters that we watch. If you're well outside like two standard deviations from the normal work hours and you're doing something at night when, you know, then it's cause for investigation. So, you know, trust but verify. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that was stated. I think policy also is, as you mentioned, very important that, uh, I, you know, I think if users are conducting malicious actions, though, you have to be able to detect it. And so my first question is, what malicious act actions are, are you aware of or are you hypothesizing? And then what capacity do you have for detecting and blocking that? Um, you know, so I think you, you really need to think about, you know, how, um, you, you monitor emails going in and out of the organization. Maybe you monitor the DNS level communications coming from your corporation and try to spot those things. Without visibility into what's actually going on, you're not ultimately going to be take, able to take action. Okay. Uh, on the matter of using blockchain for tracking changes, as mentioned by Joshua, are you referring to distributed ledger? Please comment on the tech maturity. Yes, I am. I'm, I'm referring to the idea that we, um, you know, we chain together um, hashed transactions on a distributed ledger. Actual implementation may vary. This could be just within an organization. And it's not as much the importance of the distributed ledger in this uh, situation. It's about the immutability of the transaction so that you can't go back and alter things. And the level of not anonymity associated with the transaction. So, for example, you may have a requirement of... Uh, um, for critical industry sectors to maintain a blockchain that interconnects with the government regulators so they can see the updates to critical systems and whether or not those are consistent uh, with um, you know, policy or regulations. Now, in terms of the maturity of the technology, it exists today. Uh, within Cisco in our innovation centers, we're, we're, uh, we've developed this capability and we're testing it right now. Um, you know, I think it's going to be a number of years before we see it come to market, but the technical foundations are all there today. And it looks like we have one last question. Do you see that cyber attack events evolving into cyber war as we move into the future? And how can one protect themselves from being a collateral victim? Yes, unfortunately, uh, we're in a world where cyber war can go to kinetic war very quickly. Uh, to protect yourselves, unfortunately, there isn't a ton you can do other than lobby your government and ask for resources to protect critical infrastructure. And uh, more has to be done that from the civil versus defense side. I think we just saw uh, recently cyber turn into kinetic uh, in Israel when the Israeli uh, defense forces attacked a suspected um, cyber attacker in, in the Palestinian state area there. Um, so, you know, that set a precedence, whether that will be a continuing precedence going forward. You know, apparently the U.S. responded to Iran's attack against a, a drone uh, by hacking some of their missile systems. I, you know, I, I think these attacks over time will become interchangeable. Cyber attacks that lead to kinetic attacks, kinetic attacks that lead to cyber attacks, and we won't really distinguish between the two of them. In terms of protection, I think your point is good. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us today in our session on building a cyber resilient workplace by minimizing human errors. I want to thank you, uh, say a big thanks to my panelists uh, for providing valuable insight from the different perspectives. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, further questions, I'm sure we'll be back here on the side um, to chat a little bit before the next session. And thank you very much. Thank you.